Welcome to a special edition of the Pinsari Basketball uh, YouTube channels. I don't know, this is not a mailbag edition. This is, however, the third in a line of Darko videos. The first was really a somewhat scattered reaction. The second was more of a hypothesis on what the hiring meant. And while I do expect that in a couple of days, we're going to hear from Darko and we're going to hear from him about what he hopes to implement, how he feels about the roster, I thought it would be a really good exercise to really understand the person that you've hired here, what he believes in. Now, it's really difficult to ascertain what a person believes in when they haven't always been a head coach, right? I mean, can you really glean what Trevor Gleason believes because of how the Raptors played this past year? Can you glean what Rico Hines believes because of how the Raptors? No, assistant coaches have to take orders from their head coaches. And Darko has been an assistant coach for most of his NBA career, if not all of his NBA career. And so it's really difficult. What do you do? Do you evaluate Tulsa footage? Do you go back to his work with Red Star? Do you look at the national team work with the Serbian? No, I think what I wanted to do was try to identify what parts about him stayed the same. So how did I do this? A couple of things. So number one, I texted and emailed every single person that I could that would have a slightest clue about this, this included media people, this included people who maybe have had played against him, played against his teams, et cetera, played for him. The second thing I did was I read, I read a lot over the last, you know, eight hours, call it obsessive, but I wanted to understand a little bit more about the type of person that the Raptors have hired. <clears throat> the third thing that I did was I listened to a full hour and a half podcast that he did about four years ago in which he talks about, he talks very openly and very candidly about his philosophy in basketball. And then I started to peg in things that repeatedly occurred. And what I came down to was 11 principles or what I call Darko's 11 point philosophy. And it goes through very quickly with adaptability, equal accountability, different strokes, trim the fat, stoic balance, drop ego, dialogue over monologue, honest feedback, freedom inside the lines, connectedness and symbiosis and help the helper. Um, I will expand on every single one of these. I hope, I pray, I'm really hoping for myself that I can keep this under 25 minutes, that I can keep this very um, meaty and not a lot of ums and staggering and stammering and stuff. So hopefully we can go through this pretty quickly. And I just wanted to give people an insight into really, I think, why the Raptors hired him. Because, you know, these these coaching interviews can be very long, very drawn out. My girlfriend was just asking me, she's like, what do these coaching interviews even sound like? And I can glean from just listening to stories over the years that sometimes it can be six, seven, eight hours. It can be creative problem solving. It can be hypothetical questions. It could be, you know, um, skill testing and aptitude type stuff too. It's like, how do you manage this situation? You're in game six, this has happened. How do you manage that situation? So it really does come down to who is the person making these decisions? Who is the person that you are tasking here to, let's say, lead the next chapter of your organization's history? And especially given everything that happened last year with the Raptors and given everything that's, you know, just been the case with chemistry and lack of development, I thought it was really important to try to understand how this is a bit of a departure from Nick Nurse. Because obviously it's not a complete 180. Like, you know, I said yesterday it was a 180. It's not a complete 180. You know, it'd be impossible to do a complete 180. Obviously, there's going to be some overlaps in terms of schemes and, you know, maybe even certain defensive principles that are going to be borrowed in. But let's see if there's a, if there's a 180 departure from the type of treatment that players can expect. So let's go to adaptability, right? So really in the asterisks, I put change with personnel. Um, it's an ability to tailor your, are you guys hearing a buzzing noise? I'm hearing a bit of a, a buzz. I don't know what's going on there. So it's an ability to tailor your schemes to your roster, trying to understand, okay, we have long defenders or we have switchable defenders. Let's, let's tailor this. We have really great shooters. Let's work with that. Um, nothing is set in stone. He talks about 0.5, right? He talks about 0.5 a lot. And 0.5 to those who don't who didn't watch the last live or just are unfamiliar with this, this, this term is borrowed from 
the San Antonio Spurs offense, in which they call it zero second, zero second decision making. So basically the ball is always humming or you're driving it or you're passing it. There isn't a lot of, you know, surveying and, you know, just looking around the court and figuring out what's going on. There's not a lot of pound, pound isolation basketball. It's more or less just about uh, making quick reads. But then he's asked, okay, well, you know, is there a situation where you might slow it down and put it in someone's hands? And he's like, absolutely. You know, there are certain situations where you have a really talented player and they have a favorable matchup, in which case you can ex- attack that. And so there isn't a rigidity to it. It's adaptable and he can adjust. He will adjust to someone being out. He's going to change certain things. So I think adaptable mindsets tend to be tend to be the, you know, the the most successful in the NBA when you look at people like Phil Jackson, when you look at um, Eric Spolster, when you look at Greg Popovich. I mean, look at how many different iterations, different types of rosters, different builds these guys have been successful with. I mean, you know, Phil Phil Jackson had success with Michael and, and uh, you know, Scottie Pippen and then created success with Shaq and Kobe. You cannot imagine, like, it's such a different type of system that you would implement, but – you know, again, adaptability. When there's a will, there's a way. You, 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 you're a smart person. You, you find ways to adapt your um, thing. The other thing um, that I think adaptability um, comes down to is really adjusting how you're dealing with people based on who you're dealing with. And I wonder, you know, I never really met Nick Nurse. Um, I think it was only around him for like a day in my whole life, but. I wonder if, especially in the last year, there was a little bit of, you know, hey, man, read the room. You know, this person, that person, and that person are just not picking it up. Um, And so you have to adapt as well. The second thing is accountability. And this is the one that I think a lot of people in the Raptors Twitter sphere have really grasped onto. And it's really music to their ears because one of the biggest complaints for the Raptors uh, last year was that it felt like there were different rules for different people that Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam could take a, you know, could take a couple possessions off on defense, but Gary Trent couldn't, you know, um, that Fred and Pascal could take a really stupid shot, but then uh, Gary Trent or Precious Achua would get benched for doing the exact same thing. And so that different level of accountability, his belief system is that stars and most of his players, all of his players want to win. And that everyone knows who the best player is. So there's no need to drum that home. But when you hold stars accountable, especially again, you got to consider like the San Antonio influence coming here, growing up as an admirer of San Antonio. If you admired their philosophy, if you admire their style, there are certain things you just subconsciously have adopted. And one of those things is accountability. That was one of the things with San Antonio where Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker, those guys weren't above the rules. And I think that's a really important thing. The third thing um, builds off of adaptability, which is different strokes. He talks a lot about um, younger players. You know, he talks about them having a different attention span, learning in different ways. And so what it comes down to really, if you Google a picture, like if you Google Darko Ryakovic and and you just start looking at pictures of him, you will often see pictures of him with a laptop open in his lap and a player looking at the laptop, either smiling, laughing, deep thought. And it was surprising to me when, you know, um, when I Googled him, how many times that picture seemed to reoccur with different players. There was like one with Desmond Bain. There was one with, uh, you know, Devin Booker. And I'm like, God, like how many times is this guy on the sidelines during a game, just showing someone something on his laptop? And I just really wanted to understand this. And he said, it's because a lot of players are visual learners that, you know, if you're an auditory, you know, and and I think uh, just a little bit of peppering background, I don't want to do too much of a sidebar here. I was a tutor. I think teaching has been one of my biggest strengths. And also, you know, early on, one of my biggest weaknesses, because I had one way of teaching. And when I was a math tutor, um, all throughout university and onward, one of the things I was trying to do was learn how to teach. You know, it's such an important thing. And you would work with these kids and they were on their sixth tutor, fifth tutor, and you just couldn't connect to them. You know, I, I had a very similar experience even in grade nine when we go back to, her, you know, our grade school. And we would try to talk about uh, talk to kids and do reading buddy stuff and, and give them like some insight, especially the kids who were sort of on the margins who were being, you know, maybe who were failing or who weren't taking their studies seriously. And you're trying to break through to somebody and you have to find a way to make that connection. And 
sure, you know, you have a way that you want to say it. You think that you're right. You have an ego about it. Why should you have to adapt? They should adapt. You know, you're giving them something valuable. But at the end of the day, a really good teacher understands that if what you're saying isn't being picked up, then you're speaking to an empty forest. You know, there's nothing happening here. So the important thing there is to adapt your messaging. And, you know, this different strokes element comes down to players, you know, in the modern NBA, just existing in a different generation. I mean, we have such a limited attention span. So if you're a coach who likes to go on, you know, 45, 50 minute sermons about everything that's gone wrong, well, about five minutes into six minutes in that player is going to tune you out. You have to find a way to engage their minds. And I think that he has found that through the use of visual aids, right? Um, the fourth thing, you know, he talks about is trimming the fat. So understanding what works and what doesn't, and for each specific team, different things are going to work. So if there is a, you know, a player who responds particularly poorly to constructive, uh, you know, constructive criticism in a, in a group setting, he's going to stop doing that, right? Because it's not effective to, to shut a player down. He doesn't want the shutdown. I think that's, that's more than anything. He just doesn't want the shutdown. He wants the, he wants the mind to stay open and receptive. So, you know, whether that's doing that or whether that, you know, he realized that drills are overrated, you know, he doesn't have to start every single practice with a three man weave or something like that. He can go right into playing and he's not afraid, you know, at least in Phoenix and in Memphis uh, under Taylor Jenkins and Monty, Monty Williams, they weren't afraid to stop the play. So while a scrimmage is happening in practice, they'll stop the play and then they'll teach. They'll be like, hey, what do you what do you think about this? What did you see there? And there's sort of a back and forth communication. And we'll get into that with, you know, dialogue over monologue. But I think that that is a really important thing to try and do what is working, more of what is working, and to try to cut out what isn't working, even if it goes against tradition, to have faith that, hey, like we trust ourselves, we trust our process here, and it doesn't have to be just one way. Um, number five, which was stoic balance. Man, this was, view, uh, this was news to me, right? I think we have a tendency to overreact to a bad call to a bad game, to a bad shooting stretch by a particular player. And I've always found that Masai Ujiri really liked players and, and coaches who were very stoic. It's probably why he likes Scotty Barnes to some extent, because he's a pretty even keel guy. He tries to keep his focus. And it's really like such a huge part of why Mark Gasol and you know Danny Green and Kawhi Leonard were so successful here is because they have that sort of stoic mindset in terms of how they approach their day-to-day -day habits. You know, and honestly, this is an open, you know, unsolicited advice to anybody. If you want to be more successful in your life, adopt stoicism. It is it is unimaginable how many good things come into your life when you stop flip-flopping and reacting to every small thing. So he gave one example of Ricky Rubio, right? So he said, you know, we're in a film session and we're doing, you know, a film session and Ricky Rubio has five turnovers the previous game but he didn't have a single turnover for over the past five games. We're not going to show clips of Ricky Rubio doing the five turnovers because it's not a trend line. It's not something that's becoming a problem. It's not something that we need to talk about. And then the other thing is Ricky Rubio knows he had five turnovers. So there's really no need. So that kind of comes down to the next point, which is drop the ego, right? So one thing that I found with Dick Nurse is a lot of the stuff that he did, whether that was complaining to the refs, there were so many times where he's complaining to a ref and it negatively impacted the team. Or there were times where he called out a player and it didn't feel like the message was heard the way it was intended to be heard. Or he benched somebody and it backfired. And it always seemed to happen this way. Very rarely were buttons being pushed that were actually activating the players as opposed to deactivating the players or disengaging the players or disgruntling the players. And I think that that comes down to ego, right? Because at the end of the day, the point of any film session should not be, I'm right, you're wrong. That should never be it, right? And this is something I have to remind myself constantly that, you know, there has to be a bigger picture here. There has to be a, you know, I have to get my point across. This person has to learn. And if I'm not getting my point across, you know, if I'm trying to get my point across at the expense of this person learning, because I'm triggering all of these defense mechanisms with them because I'm being such an egomaniac and I'm not willing to listen to them. And that's another thing he talks about, which we'll talk about with, um, you know, dialogue over monologue, which kind of comes down to, you know, dropping the ego so we can sort of bunch these two things together. He talks about really having a dialogue with players and trying to veer away from 
I'm looking for an answer. Do you have the right answer to leaving yourself open to finding out more about the players through the answers that they provide? So for instance, you know, um, I'll give you an example. So let's say with Devin Booker, right? <clears throat> so you have Devin Booker and Devin Booker is uh, getting blitzed on a screen and he has a wide open cutter and he misses him. Right. But he also has a corner shooter at maybe a disadvantageous angle um, where there's a, where there's an offensive, you know, where there's a defensive player kind of gapping the passing lanes and it's a really good defensive player. So there's a very high likelihood of that being a turnover. Right. So if you paint out that scenario, there's one play, one play that's the right play. There's one play that's the wrong play. And then there's the kind of middle play, which is just holding the ball and waiting for something else to open up. And let's just say, for instance, you talk to Devin Booker and you say, OK, well, you know, in this moment, we needed you to make this pass. And maybe you don't say it that way. You just say, hey, Devin, like, what what do you think you should have done here? And I think that what what can be complicated there is if you're only looking for one answer, like you're only looking for him to say, okay, the guy cutting, you know, or the that guy cutting back door, like I should have I should have found him. Because if he tells you that he could have found the shooter in the corner, that's a great teaching moment too. That's a great way for you to come together and sort of connect on that and be like, hey, do you see this defender kind of gapping the passing lane here? This would have been this probably if you do this nine times out of 10, that's going to be a turnover. You don't want to do that. Can you imagine a dialogue or a discussion like that with someone like a Precious Achua or a Gary Trent Jr.? You know, there's nothing stopping these guys from becoming better playmakers, right? Like, I do think playmaking to some extent can be taught. And the best example for Darko has been Desmond Bain, for sure. You know, you can look at Tyus Jones, you can definitely look at DeAnthony Melton, but it has never quite been like one of the most, you know, you talk about Pascal Siakam's development. I think Desmond Bain's development is almost just as interesting as Pascal's because he kind of com comes in as this, you know, shooting guy. Like, you know, he shoots, he shoots the basketball, but he doesn't have much playmaking. He doesn't do much else. He's not a secondary creator. And I tell you, in the, in the, in the games without John Morant, if you watched Desmond Bain, he not only has morphed himself over the last three, four years into a secondary creator, I think he could play spot minutes as a primary creator. His playmaking has evolved that much. And it started in summer league with Darko Ryakovich. Basically, they were talking about um, how can we unlock this element of your game? And it, it came down to shadowing. It came down to discussions, long, lengthy video sessions where they're just talking, talking, talking about okay well what what's this option what's that option and that sort of dialogue creates not only learning for the player but also you learn as a coach about your player you understand how they're thinking and maybe just maybe they see something you don't see and you always have to leave yourself open to that and that just comes back to dropping the ego you have to leave yourself open to being you know uh surprised by something your players see and there has to be that sort of mutual respect because as we've seen you know, in the modern NBA with the amount of money these guys are making, this whole like, I'm the boss, you're you're the servant type of mentality, it just doesn't work. There has to be some sort of, you know, push pull with these players. And I think that he really gets that. Um, the eighth thing he talks about was honest feedback. And I really like this, you know, this honesty element is really important to me, which is, you know, you don't have secrets with your players, right? You don't have secrets with your staff you don't have a secret agenda where you know you're trying to get two or three guys paid and everyone can see that you're trying to get these two to three guys paid and you're playing favorites and you just can't admit it you know you think that nick nurse ever walked into a locker room and just openly told everyone hey i know that you're sensing it but fred van vliet and pascal siakam operate above the rules you think that ever happened you think he just ever walked in and said you know i have a personal vendetta against this young player who just keeps not getting minutes no, he never he never did that. And that sort of erodes the honesty and the trust and the communication. Um, one of the things you kind of gather with with Darko, and again, you you don't know if this is going to carry forward as a as a head coach because so much of player communication and development comes down to assistant coaches, and you wonder if some of the things that he's been able to do in the past as an assistant are still going to carry over. But by understanding his philosophy, you will at least understand how he will dictate his staff. Does that make sense? Like, he's going to obviously hire six or seven assistants, right? Those people are going to be under his watch. They're going to be, you know, defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, player personnel, whatever. Like, they're going to be, 
you know, the scouts, all of these people are going to be under him, video coordinator. Every one of these people is going to be taking marching orders from what is Raptors, what is the Raptors way to do stuff now? And they're going to be asking him. More importantly than anything, they're going to be asking him. And so if he is very clear on how this communication and sort of, um, you know, flow between the players and, and the coaches is going to go, well, then that's going to carry forward. And he's going to be basically, and this is why coaching trees are so important, because we're talking about consistently, we're talking about like a way of coaching, like the philosophy of coaching. So honesty is a really big part of it. And so if you're going to be like very clear, crystal clear with your staff, like, hey, we're not going to lie to the players. We're going to be direct. We're going to be honest. We're not trying to humiliate them. We're just going to keep it straight. So if a player played poorly, we're going to be able to tell them that they played poorly. If, if you know, if they're playing great and above their heads, if they're going to be benched, we're going to keep that line of communication open. How many coaches there are, you wouldn't believe in the NBA where they will bench a guy and not even communicate that to him. And, you know, players feel it. And then the worst part is every other player is watching you treat that player that way too. And then that kind of erodes the trust over, some, over a period of time because you start to feel like, okay, well, if it could happen to him, it could happen to me, right? I'm watching how you're treating Malachi Flynn if I'm Ron Harper Jr. I'm watching how you treat Jeff Doughton if I am, you know, uh, Joe Wieskamp. Obviously, all of these things are going to have a carry forward effect. So this honesty thing is just such a, I think it's such a fundamental part of every organization that you need to be honest, um, not only with your staff, but also with your players. Um, feed them inside the lines is the ninth thing. And I think this one's important. He talks about establishing structure, but then allowing players freedom within that structure. So build the structure and then build freedom out from that, as opposed to take total freedom and then try to build structure within that freedom. It's a completely different approach to it. So you simplify everything and then you start giving more options within that. I'll give you an example. So let's just say we're going to have a rule. We're going to have five rules, right? Or we're going to have like two actions that we're going to run. We're going to run a horns action and, you know, a, a particular, you know, high pick and roll or something. And, and, and out of that, there's going to be, you know, three options, three options to, to op for on opening night. And there's going to be four other options that we're not going to implement until later on in the season. But first, we're going to make sure that we get those three options. Then we're going to start adding a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh option. And then over a period of time, once those principles of how we're going to play have been sort of cemented and established, then instead of a system or a particular set of plays or schemes, we're going to start opening it up to just guiding principles, right? So the 0 0.5 is a guiding principle. It's not a play. 0 0.5 is not a, it's not a play. Uh, paint to grade is not a play. Um, good to great is not a play. None of these things are plays. They are just guiding principles. They are a general philosophy of how you want to play basketball. Um, and he believes that structure is important for young players and, you know, even veteran players to understand where they're supposed to be at given times and, you know, to, to provide some sort of accountability. Because you can't really say what you should have been doing if I don't articulate what we ought to be doing, right? Like you can't say, okay, well, you know, you didn't cut here. Well, the player can be like, but that's not our scheme. That's the like, guy was never told to cut here. So now you're just going everything on, you know, chaos, too much chaos. So I think last year there was just a lot of plays where if we go back and look at the film, or if, even if you go and look back at some of the low light films, there was a lot of pounding the rock. Sure. But there was a lot of lack of movement. And when you start to see like how all of these principles are going to impact things, when you consider like the impact of holding the ball. Now, I understand Nick Nurse became very tunnel visioned about reducing turnovers, winning the possession battle due to a lack of success or sorry, a lack of talent on his team. And I, don't, I fully understand that. And, and mathematically and schematically and maybe scientifically, it makes total sense. But consider the ramifications of holding the ball for so long. Well, after a period of time, players stop moving, you know, because you can only cut into space 15 to 20 times. And we saw so many you know, videos of Scotty or OG demanding the ball after they're wide open under the basket, not getting it because, you know, the pass is a little bit risky and maybe it'll be like a 1% chance of a turnover and Fred's not making that pass because he doesn't want the turnover. And so after a period of time when players are ignored on cuts like this and cuts are such an important part of how basketball is played today, they stop cutting, they stop moving. Because what point is there to move when you know the player with the ball is never going to give it up to you? So I think that, you know, and then 
it comes down to really to take a bit of a detour here. It comes down to the type of shots you're getting, right? So again, yesterday we talked about it. There's so much that's been made about the Raptors not having shooters. I think they didn't take great shots. I think the types of shots that they took were out of rhythm. And I was always taught that the ball had energy, that after a swing from a side to side, that that ball was more likely to go in. You know, one of the things that happened in Phoenix uh, when they started implementing these rules, you notice that Darko was only a coach in Phoenix for one year, and that was Devin Booker's most efficient year. Um, it was very interesting. He had a really close relationship with him. And you see this uptick of about 3.4% true shooting. And that was the first year that Devin Booker became an all-star. And then the very next year, it went down a little bit, and then it went up a little bit. But it, it didn't quite get up to that height again. And one of the things he talked about was really getting Devin Booker off the ball quickly, getting him to drive off the catch, right? To get him to make faster decisions, it sped everything up. It started to it started to initiate him more as a playmaker. Now when you see Devin Booker, he's a much more complete player than he was in 2018, 2019, for sure. And I think a lot of that comes down to simplification within this offense within the you know rules that they created and all the teaching that happened in that moment and they really made him like one of the best players in the nba through that i'm very excited to see what they can do for some of the young players the raptors because the tools are there right anyways um the 11th uh, sorry the 10th thing is connectedness and symbiosis so this idea of I eat, we eat, you know, this idea of having a joint discussion. He talks about film sessions and one of the most interesting parts of that podcast and one of the most interesting things about the feedback that we got. Uh, one of the players that I talked to said, I'd never talked more in a film session than I did with him. Like it somehow just it became an environment where you felt safe to voice stuff. You And, and so and in the pod, he talks about how they would do like smaller groups, larger groups. Um, they would call things out. They would they would have players who would come in and that they would guide it. And they would say, okay, this is what I see. This is what I don't see. And then that would ultimately, you know, cue another player talking and another player talking. And so something that I was noticing with the Denver Nuggets, a couple of games, oh, sorry, in game four when they won, was it was just nonstop communication. It was nonstop talking. Jokic just talking to Jamal Murray, like, hey, next time down the court, I want to be a little bit higher on this um you know michael porter jr is talking like they're all just it's constant communication and you see it on the bench as well you know david adelman and mike malone they're talking you know and with the raptors it was a completely different thing there's a lot of you know people just kind of like staring off into space and it just felt miserable and that communication is important that lines of communication have to be important and in order to do that you have to connect people you have to connect them through you know, um, small things, right? Uh, Greg Popovich talks a lot about, you know, the wine, you know, for the, they do like these really uh, elaborate, long, you know, four or five hour wine dinners for assistant coaches, where they talk about things other than basketball. Um, one of the things that I heard from a player who was, um, I think it was like, I don't know, it was like 14 or 15 years ago, and they said that it was the most unique draft interview that they ever had with the San Antonio Spurs because they actually brought them out to dinner and they brought them out to a, it was like a cuisine that they had never been to. Like it was like some sort of weird, you know, maybe like they were just used to Roscoe's chicken and waffles or like, you know, um, IHOP and shit. And then suddenly they're in like this really fine Italian restaurant or Argentinian restaurant and they were just like kind of forced to see how they would interact in that difficult, uh, different surrounding. And I just thought that it was interesting that even at that stage in the draft interview, they still wanted to break bread with players. They still wanted to have that sort of connection to meet them outside of an office setting. Um, and I think if you're talking about culture building, you got to do things differently. Whether you look at the culture of Google, whether you look at the culture of Facebook, you talk about every successful organization, every single successful company, they found their own way to activate people. Because one thing you realize over a period of time is happy employees lead to lower turnover, lower turnover leads to uh, more effective results. So it just kind of comes down to that is like you can have 150 different versions of any employee that you have, or any player that you have. And at the end of the day, your success or failure as a coach is always going to come down to did I get something close to the best version of that person. And I think that connectedness and symbiosis whenever that player feels like they are connected to you. They can have an honest conversation with you. They can ask you for honest feedback. They can talk to each other that that sort of relationship has been fostered. The leadership 
the coaching staff, everything is sort of in alignment and simpatico, if you will, then I think that you then end up in a situation where you can bank on having good results. Finally, help the helper. So identifying the people within your organization that will have the biggest impact on, you know, growth and activating them. Um, sometimes you have a genius coach on your bench, or you have a player who has incredible veteran leadership, and you have to know the right button to push to make sure that they know that they have a platform to express their strengths. And I think that this is such an important thing is that, you know, all organizations have hidden talents, you know, every single person, you know, you might be a very disorganized boss, and maybe your secretary is really great at organizing. I mean, this is a really terrible example. But I think I think you get it. Like there's there's partnerships where, you know, you bridge gaps, you figure it out. Um, maybe you have a person on your staff who is really great at connecting with the type of player that you can't connect with. You as a coach need to know that that person has to be activated and has to be initiated and has to be guided and, and enabled to do that for you. You have to be able to do that. You have to also be constantly building up the people around you. And I think that that's important. You know, um, if Fred Van Vliet had a different approach to life, if he had less of a defensive approach, then he would realize that the better Scotty was, the better he would be, right? I mean, he, he'd probably see that, right? I mean, I hope he would be able to see that. But it's it's about the suspension of control. You're giving up some element of control for the greater good. And I think that the helping the helper element is always about the greater good. It's always about putting the team first. It's about putting everything above yourself. And, you know, that means also like when you have a debate with one of your assistants, that it isn't an automatic shutdown. It isn't an automatic, well, I'm the coach and I'm right. It's about listening to your assistants. I'm going to tell you, the assistants on the Raptors coaching staff last year did not look happy. There was a lot of infighting. There was a lot of, you know, eyebrows being raised. There wasn't a lot of that stuff that you see on the better teams where, you know, guys are constantly communicating on the bench. They're like showing each other ideas. It just wasn't happening. And I don't mean to infer too much into body language analysis and pseudoscience, but as someone who watched 82 games, 83 games, 83 games of the Raptors this past season, I can tell you that it was obvious. It was obvious from a mile away that these 11 principles were not happening. And, you know, when Masai Ujiri, Bobby Webster, when they came out at the end of the season, they talked to all the players. I think one of the things that, you know, was sort of shocking to me was just Masai Ujiri saying, I didn't like watching this team play. I didn't enjoy it. I don't think you can. Can you think of another example of a general manager or president just openly saying that in public, that I did not enjoy watching my team play? Um, it was refreshing. It was refreshing candor. And, you know, it may have taken a little long to figure that out, but I'm really glad they did. And I think that, you know, the more I think about it, the more I feel like I really understand why they hired him. Because the more I heard about him, the more I heard from him, the more I listened to that podcast, the more I realized that these were the answers that he was giving in this interview that by and far put him on a different level than all the other candidates. So, um, Yeah. Anyways, guys, have a great one. I wanted to keep this short. Thankfully, um, it's pretty short, but it's still 33 minutes. And maybe there's like another five, six minutes that I could cut out at some point. Too much rambling. But anyway. Um, yeah, um, this is this is a great point. Uh, the one year where he was the offensive coordinator for um Oh, this is interesting. So uh, saying, according to Lewis Zatzman, um, second spectrum, in the years he was in Memphis, they ran the fewest ISOs per 100 possessions in the league. I believe this was also the case for the one year he was in Phoenix. They were the second fewest. Um, it was the second fewest. I'm pretty sure. I, I, I'm pretty sure I remember this uh, from a few years ago. The Suns offense, they ran the second fewest isolations that year. So anyway, so he doesn't believe in that. He does not believe in, you know, um, one guy sort of dominating the basketball, but he also doesn't believe that motion solves everything. He doesn't believe in like completely taking away a player's right to, you know, survey a mismatch and to dominate, you know. Um, 
I think he has a really refreshing and very balanced approach to basketball. And I really look forward to seeing, um, I really look forward to seeing what happens in summer league. First of all, um, Christian Coloco and the 13th overall pick is going to be really exciting to watch. And perhaps more so than ever, I'm really looking forward to Raptors training camp. I can't say it enough. Watching this team last year was painful, torturous, even. It's really difficult to watch something that you love or a team that you love do something that you know is not effective over and over and over and over again. So it's, you know, maybe all of the pain and frustration of last year has led to how excited I am for this year because it feels like it's been like a year and a half since I've really, really been like a supporter of Raptors basketball and how they're playing. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm happy for the players. I think they're going to be really happy under him and I can't wait. Anyways, make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already. This will be the final of the Darko videos. We will do a live um, for when his press conference is and we'll do a watch party for that. But other than that, I expect this to be the end of the coaching videos. I never imagined in my entire life that I'd make this many videos about who the Raptors should be you know, picking as a coach or whatever. But it is important. It is obviously very important. And uh, hopefully from next week onward, we can turn our focus back to the draft. And what will effectively be three to, I want to say three to six players that should be very highly regarded for the Raptors 13th overall pick. All right. Take care. Peace, guys. Thank you.